So our third and final talk for today uh, in the containers track is another talk on Kubernetes. Um, Sandy Park, uh, who's local to Austin, local, because I, I put that in quotes because he's always traveling a lot. Uh, but we're, we're fortunate to have uh, Kubernetes expertise uh, in the community. And Sandy actually like talks a lot at uh, Cloud Austin, Docker Austin. He's kind of, whenever he's here, he's kind of like, you know, helping us with, with the topic of Kubernetes. So with that, uh, let's give him a round of applause and get kicked off. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Karthik, for the introduction. Uh, and thanks to DevOps Days for giving me a chance to speak. Uh, so I want to talk about continuous integration, continuous delivery um, in Kubernetes, using Kubernetes, um, not necessarily for, but for stuff on top of Kubernetes. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, that's CircusMonkey without the vowels, C-R-C-S-M-N-K-Y. Please don't heckle me. Or if you do, do it on Twitter, uh, not, not live here. Um, so I work on the solutions architecture team at Google. So what our team basically does is uh, we spend a good amount of time helping customers with, try to, with trying to build things on Google Cloud Platform. And then we spend the vast majority of our time, though, writing like white papers, sample code, blog posts, that kind of stuff, evangelizing you know, how to build things out of the bag of puzzle pieces that is uh, GCP. So with that, let's get started. So, uh, so why is continuous integration, why is continuous delivery important? Uh, right, you want that bulletproof process to go from code to production, right? That's the, the ideal. Um, you want a centralized, repeatable approach to building, tagging, pushing, you know, all that kind of stuff that, that for all of your assets, for all your container images, that sort of things. Um, you want to be able to iterate quickly and reasonably reliably. Um, it's not, you know, this is all the ideal, right? The, the real world is a little bit different, but um, the other big part of this is, and this is specific to Kubernetes, is you want to keep your hands off of kube control. Um, Kube control is like sort of the centralized CLI for Kubernetes. Super, super powerful. Don't use it if, unless you absolutely have to, right? You want to make sure that power is only with a certain amount of, of, of a select few individuals or select automated systems to make sure you're not obliterating your cluster. Um, I, there have been many, many times where I have fat fingered a Kubernetes cluster by basically screwing up calls with Kube control because I'm not a robot, I'm a human, and I make mistakes on a regular basis. All right, so what does continuous integration look like? You start with code, you test that stuff locally, you commit your changes, you push them back to the repo, you start a build, and then you test, right? That's the, that's the perfect workflow. That's how it always goes for everybody, right? Always straight from, you know, from work to success. Um, the real world probably looks like this, right? You code, you test, you realize you broke a test, you broke something, you gotta go back and fix it again. Commit, push, you build, you broke the build, fine, go back to code again. Start the process, and finally you get to like integration testing. You broke something else. Start again at code. Right? That's probably how it goes on a regular basis for, for most of y'all. Um, with delivery, it looks a little, about the same thing, right? You get to that kind of continuous build step or continuous integration step, testing, deploying, and then you kind of do deployment out to either testing or staging environments to actually you know review changes, make sure things look good before you roll something out into production. It's pretty much the flow. Um, deployment looks about the same. We're not going to cover too much of continuous deployment today, although uh, when you get to, uh, in Kubernetes land, it kind of starts melding together a little bit towards the end, but ultimately you, you, know, you deliver this stuff, you approve those changes before they go to production, you deploy them back out to production, and then the dollars just start rolling in. Right? That's pretty much how it goes in software. All right, so why do we care about doing stuff in a continuous manner? Uh, you want to fail fast, right? You want to know that the build broke as quickly as possible. Uh, it's just like you would do unit testing locally, right? The reason you do that locally is because you get immediate feedback to say, all right, I know what broke, I know how to fix it before I push it back out. The same applies to kind of more integration level testing. Uh, you wanna be able to triage fast, right? You wanna figure out why the build broke, so you can go either, you know, tap on someone's shoulder and yell at them or yell at them over Slack, or at least go figure out what system was in play that broke, you know, what pieces didn't, didn't fit together. And ultimately, you wanna get your software out faster, right? You want to get it into your users or customers' hands as quickly as possible, and you want it to be, you know, as qualitatively good as possible. You want to know that it was fully tested across the board to make it work. So what are some of the tools that people use to do this stuff? Um, this is kind of the, the sort of the, the standard approach here, right? Like we've got Travis, Jenkins, Circle CI, TeamCity, uh, Bamboo is still a pretty, big, pretty popular choice. Um, the one I want to talk about today in terms of Kubernetes is Jenkins. So I want to walk through a little bit of what it looks like to deploy Jenkins inside a Kubernetes cluster and how you might use that to deploy like a simple microservice. 
So let's start with Jenkins. So um, if you do this in a Kubernetes cluster, I did this on, on GCP, so it's, it's uh, under Google Container Engine, but this would apply to any Kubernetes cluster from an architectural pers uh, perspective. Some of the little details might be different if you're on AWS or if you're on Rackspace or Azure or anything else. Uh, but you start with a basic three node Kubernetes cluster and you start the Jenkins leader and then you kick off the Jenkins service, right? So this is how you actually expose the Jenkins leader uh, to the rest of the stack. And then you would plug in like an ingress. In this case, since I was on GKE, it plugs in the Google Cloud Load Balancer. So this is how I get from the internet, right, which is the cloud, um, through the load balancer back into the Jenkins leader. And then you've got Jenkins builders. And that's pretty much it, right? You've got a set of uh, builders deployed on each node. And again, this is just an example, but um, you could have this be as large as it needs to be if you've got a lot of software running through, a lot of um, images you're, you're building, tagging, pushing on a regular basis. But this is basically what the deployment looks like. Now, in the past, what we've done when we've done deployments like this is we'll actually use like a replication controller to deploy a number of workers. The upside to that is that those workers are ready to rock as soon as you push code into the, you know, as soon as the leader checks out a project and tries to build it. The downside is you've got idle resources, right? You might not need to have those builders sitting there running all the time. So the nice thing over the last few months, um, as, as I've kind of iterated on this content, is that there is actually now a Kubernetes Jenkins or Jenkins Kubernetes, whichever way you want to look at it, plugin that lets you auto spawn those builders. So now what you can do is you sort of live with this on a regular basis, right? This is what sort of the, the steady state looks like. And as you submit jobs to go through, the builders will automatically spawn based on the incoming work, and then they'll just sort of uh, get trashed when you're done with them. So it's kind of nice, you're not really, you're maximizing resources. And it, it fits the Kubernetes approach of kind of, you know, being as efficient as humanly possible in a cluster a lot better. All right, so let's talk about what that looks like in a microservices deployment. Again, this is a pretty simple one. So um, wrote this little, basically there's, there's two components to it. There's a back end and a front end. And all it does is report back the instance metadata of the instance it's running on. Um, so the back end version just gives you a JSON response. Uh, the front end version gives you a nice little card using like the material UI of the same instance metadata, but you might hit it both ways, right? Somebody might want to see a visual representation and come in through the front end. Somebody might want to hit it from the API side and come in through the, the JSON front end. Either case is fine. So if you look at the way that, the way that might look in a two node cluster, for example, um, first you would deploy the back end as a replication controller with three nodes. Uh, then you would open up that service so it can be hit from you know, external, external, uh, external users. Again, same thing with that ingress controller. So you would uh, start the service with the ingress and then it plugs directly into the load balancer on your platform. So you get incoming traffic coming through. And then you deploy the front end replication controller and the front end controller talks to the back end via the back end service. Then you have the front end service which plugs again back into the load balancer. So now basically requests can come in from external users through the load balancer either directly to the back end if they want the API version or through the front end if they want the visual representation of the data and that thing. This is a typical approach you might see for microservices. And of course, this is a hilariously constrained example, right? You're probably gonna have something far more complicated depending on what your deployment looks like. Um, but the nice thing is that what you can do in Kubernetes is, is basically carve up a large cluster, right? In the slides, we've got you know, three nodes or two nodes for a cluster, but Kubernetes clusters are basically up to, I think we're up to about 1,000 nodes now, and it's kind of continuing to go up to towards 5,000 as the next major milestone in 1.3. The idea with namespaces is you get to carve up that existing, or that, that giant cluster into smaller bits. So you might do things like dev test, staging, production, different testing environments, and you have control over pushing individual RCs and services or pods, depending on the level you're working with, to different parts of that cluster. And you can control those namespaces with things like quotas. So you may have your production cluster be just a namespace in a giant cluster and have most of the resources and maybe staging or dev test is a much smaller set. But those quotas are honored so that way you know you're only getting 10% you know, of available memory on a per node basis or 10% you know, of the CPU when you're trying to deploy into that environment. So it's kind of nice. Uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility and control over how you manage a much larger environment. Uh, when you're doing microservices, the other nice thing about the way Kubernetes works is, uh, unfortunately, you can't see those colors, so I apologize, but um, effectively what you can do is, you know, let's say you have a replication controller A that you've deployed, and it's got maybe 10 nodes or 10 pods that it's pushed out, and you want to push out, you know, replication controller version B or version 2. 
When you do that rolling update, what happens is it starts scaling A down while it scales B up until it reaches that new steady state. Um, now, what we've seen over the last few months since Kubernetes has come out is rolling update is really cool, really powerful, but it's got a little bit of limitation, right? It's, it's not a perfect mechanism. So what was added back in Kubernetes 1.1 was this new uh, top-level spec called a deployment. And a deployment lets you be a lot more declarative versus a rolling update, which is imperative, which is kind of nice. So now you can actually say, instead of saying, uh, you know, I want to update this replication controller to this new version and run it from the client side, you actually write a deployment spec, like a YAML or JSON file. You push that to the Kubernetes master, and then that does it on the server side. So it actually scales down one RC and scales up the next one at the same time. And you have a lot more control with uh, deployments instead of rolling updates. Um, you get to roll back, which is nice. The commands are a little bit simpler. You can just edit an active deployment and then apply it, and you can push it out from there. And again, you have the ability to roll it right back if you need to. Uh, and like I said, server side makes it nicer, so you're not relying on a, on a specific client environment to make this work. It's a lot more straightforward. All right, so the workflow that this kind of maps to in Kubernetes, um, right? The Kubernetes workflow is basically like you, you package your, your code into a container image, you push that container image, you tag it, et cetera, um, then you create the, the RC, and you create the service, uh, or you, sorry, you create the RC and then you expose the service back out. If you kind of map that back to Jenkins, it doesn't sort of typically fit with like the common kind of freestyle approach. So you need to use something like the workflow plugin, which is now actually built into Jenkins 2.0 um, as of a couple weeks ago now. Um, but the idea is you want to define a little bit more of a stateful pipeline to actually do this work. Because it's not a question of kind of flipping a couple of switches. It's pull this container image out or pull this code down, build into a new image, tag that image into, you know, into container uh, registry, and then deploy it back out or do the deployment operation or the rolling update mechanism to push that stuff out. Um, but the nice thing is that uh, because it's very scriptable and it's Groovy based, it's pretty easy to write and you have the ability to plug in things like human input. So you can say, after I've pushed new code, bef you know, push it into staging, that's fine, but let a human approve it before it goes out to production. And that's a much nicer approach. And the, the freestyle approach doesn't really map well to that, so the, the workflow piece fits a lot better over time. Um, this is not really readable, and I put this here just for kind of uh, the fun of it, but just an example of what a Jenkins file kind of looks like with, with the groovy stuff built in, uh, with the workflow plugin built in. It kind of goes through, basically what this does is it, it's using Docker within Docker on those Kubernetes nodes to actually build container images. So you actually do a little bit of work when you, when you lay out the original Jenkins leader pods and the worker pods to say, give them privileged Docker level access so that they, they can build images themselves. Um, but you're effectively telling it to you know, create a new environment, go do the build, and then you know, push, the, put that, push the build images back to like gcr.io, which is the container registry we host. Uh, and then you can do something like deploy it to the staging or the QA cluster, and it runs a bunch of commands, and you'll see actually, I'm gonna use the laser pointer here, but you'll see sort of on the, sort of the, the second to last and the third to last line, this is still using rolling update because uh, this repo is a little bit dated, but we're moving to a deployment-based model in a couple of weeks. Um, and then this, the next part of the Jenkins file is basically the same step as the staging one, except there's a line in there that's about the, let's see, the third line from the top, that lets you say, does this staging look good? You know, say if yes, go ahead and finish out and do the deployment to production. So it's a pretty easy, I mean, it's not really that much code, not much content, but it gives you that kind of pipelineable approach of set of steps, human approval, and then push back out to production. So that workflow, what does that look like um, when you kind of think about it, is you push code into the repo. Uh, the next thing is that, oops. Jenkins actually fires off the build because it's probably pulling your repo on a regular basis. Uh, once it's done with the build, it'll actually, uh, I'm sorry, once you tell it to build, it'll clone the repo into Jenkins, do the build, um, it'll stage it into the staging namespace, right? So we've got three namespaces here, the default namespace, staging, and production. Uh, once staging looks good, so you'd have to do some approval, right? So human input comes in there, and then it deploys into production, and that's pretty much it, right? That's, the, that's sort of the workflows that fits to Jenkins. So I went really, really fast, and I apologize for that, um, which is good because you guys can get lunch first before everybody else. But uh, so <laughs> what I want to do really quickly is just let you all know a um, uh, couple things. One, if you have any questions about, about Jenkins on Kubernetes, by all means, find me on Twitter. Happy to answer stuff. Um, these slides are available, uh, so they'll be up and posted 
whenever they post the rest of their presentations. Um, we've got a repo right now. It's uh, github.com slash Google Cloud Platform slash continuous deployment on Kubernetes. Um, that's basically what this talk is kind of built around. Uh, but it was built before Jenkins 2.0, so there's been a couple of changes. It was uh, one, obviously we moved from rolling update to the deployment spec, which is a lot nicer. Um, the second thing is that uh, it uses the ingress controller. So in the timing between the first time we did this approach versus now, um, Kubernetes didn't have built-in support for automatically hooking into like L7 load balancers. So it was a little bit more work to set up like a Nginx reverse proxy uh, for an L3 load balancer. Now it's a lot simpler because it, uh, Kubernetes supports ingress L7 as a top level item. So it's really easy to do hooking up a cloud load balancer to the front of Jenkins. Um, and then the other thing is the Jenkins Kubernetes plugin to let you auto spawn those builders. So all those changes are coming in about the next week or so. We're just waiting on like open source approval, which takes a not trivial amount of time at Google some days. So once that's done, that code will be pushed out and it'll be available there. And then we've got other, a few other papers that we've written around Kubernetes, like automating image builds with Jenkins and Packer, um, doing distributed load testing with Kubernetes is kind of cool. It uses the, the Python Locust framework to basically deploy a bunch of pods and, and you know, hit a URL with a bunch of steps or that you wanna, you wanna test against for, for kind of web load testing. Um, and then you know, papers like real-time data analysis using Kubernetes, PubSub, and BigQuery, uh, consuming off the Twitter API. So another good example there. And then the last thing I want to mention is, uh, by all means, join the GCP user group. Um, there's a good, bunch of, you know, the good amount of talks that we do. We do about one a month. It's usually anything rel relative to Google Cloud Platform. So the last one we did was about a week and a half ago, and it covered you know, all the stuff we announced at our last conference um, in late March. But you know, it's a lot of customer talks. Like we got folks from Honest Dollar, from Real Massive, doing talks on how they're using GCP in general. So not just Kubernetes, but you know, including things like PubSub, Dataflow, uh, Spark and Hadoop, or um, you know, even some of the stuff like Cloud Functions, which is sort of like uh, AWS Lambda. So a lot of fun stuff there. And it's a good little community to kind of get involved with. Um, so with that, are there any questions I can answer? Uh, so a lot of the a lot of the background of why Jenkins is basically based on interest from people. Um, now Spinnaker is seeing a lot of interest and a lot of a lot of uh, there's a lot of excitement around it. So there's been a lot of talk of figuring out how to move from or how to take Spinnaker and make it basically containerized and deploy inside of Kubernetes. The some of the the difficulty there has been stateful workloads in Kubernetes aren't what I would call perfect yet. Right, there's a little bit of a challenge with persistent disks and, thing, and things like that. And Spinner requires, the two data pieces it requires are Redis and uh, Cassandra. So there's some talk of possibly changing some of that so we can use different storage plugins. So maybe not rely on those services, but maybe something else, or even something simpler, frankly, because there's not that much sort of database intensive stuff that happens in Spinner, it just needs to capture some of those. So what they've talked about doing is possibly changing that to either support S3 or Google Cloud Storage, just as sort of you know, object storage instead, and work off of just flat files from there. So once they do some of that work, it'll make it a lot easier, and then it's easy to move, because the application part's the easy part, it's the, the stateful pieces that are a bit more challenge. Um, the Redis piece, they'll probably just leave in because it's not that complicated, and it's, yeah, so, so I think once that stuff is kind of put in and, and tested well, there's no reason why you couldn't push Spinnaker into this environment. Any other questions? Awesome. I'm going to wow. hang around for a little bit. If you guys have questions, please come find me. Happy to chat it up. All right. Let's give Sandeep a round of applause. Thank you. And we have something for you real quick. Um, so we're, uh, in terms of talks, um, this is our last session for the day uh, on the container track. We'll reconvene tomorrow after the keynote back over here, three talks, and then we're gonna do a bonus talk uh, at the Docker user uh, user group meetup thing uh, in the afternoon tomorrow as well. Um, so yeah, you guys, I think it's like a little past noon, so you get a little bit of time before, before lunch, and lunch will be back at the Touchdown Club uh, near the sponsor area. Thank you.